Hello, welcome back to Refit and Sail. My name's George, just did the Solent Boat Butler, and behind me is a Contessa 32. It's a mid 70s Contessa that is with me for a fairly extensive refit, and as part of that refit, I'm having to carry out an osmosis treatment. In an earlier video, you would have seen me peeling the hull and uh, removing seacocks, rudder, stern tube, etc. And uh, I've been going through a lot of washing out here in the open, so that's helped dry the boat out a little bit. And uh, the next stage is to get her under cover when I can apply my heat and vacuum pads and get her properly dry. Uh, and then if you keep watching, you'll see me rebuilding the surface of the underwater hull and uh, getting her ready to go back in the water. First thing for this video is one final pressure wash to uh, give her another good wash down before she goes in the shed. As you can see behind, we are now in the shed and I've got my heat mats on the boat. So uh, those are the two things stuck to the side of the hull. So that's what they look like in use. I use a bit of um, household insulation on the outside just to try and contain some of the heat. It makes it a little bit more efficient. And it saves a little bit of power. It helps the pads get up to temperature. Underneath the foil, they kind of look like this. Uh, you can see this one's kind of half on and half off the boat just because of the shape of the boat. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why I had these things made with um, fixings for the um, vacuum connectors, one in the middle and one in the corner, so I can use either one or both, um, depending on the shape of the boat. The key thing is that up here, there's a little temperature sensor in there, and I need to make sure that is in contact with the boat so that the temperature that it is set to is um, actually the temperature of the hull and not the temperature of kind of like the the free moving air so um, that's really important because we don't want it to overheat or underheat. Each of the panels has uh, one of these little temperature controllers and uh, on that I can set the temperature that I want it to come up to and then uh, maintain. Uh, it also has a timer function so I can set it for 8 hours, 10 hours, 12 hours, however long I want and it just keeps going at that temperature and then automatically switches off at the end. So you don't have to use heat and uh, vacuum to dry out a hull that's osmotic, but it speeds up the process and there are some advantages to, to doing so. Getting some heat into the laminates helps the liquid and the chemicals to come out because you're actually not just drawing out seawater, you're drawing out byproducts of the original manufacture of the um, hull laminate. But you're trying to draw out the hydroscopic chemicals that were in the original mix of the polyester as it uh, was put onto the boat. Also, by applying vacuum to the hull, or at least the surface of the hull, what you're doing is reducing the boiling point of any liquids that are in there. So um, that's what happens in space. Um, things boil off very, very quickly because there's no, um, there's no atmosphere, there's, there's a vacuum in space. So um, by having a vacuum here, um, any liquids, any chemicals that you're trying to draw out turn into a gas much more quickly and then can get sucked out of the laminate. Standing back a little bit, you can see from the area I have removed the pad, there's a very slight colour change. This is slightly unrelated to the work that I have been doing down below on the floor and on the bottom, but I'm taking a break from laminating and uh, doing other work to do some deck repairs. So off camera, which you didn't see, is I have removed all of the deck gear. So all the winches, all the uh, random cleats, spinnaker winches, the whole lot, because it's all getting replaced. But some of it 
isn't getting replaced because if you go for self-tailing winches you no longer need the cleats that were attached to the deck which has unfortunately left some unsightly holes so if we drop you down like that you can see this is where the primary winch is so I'm not too worried about that but back here if I go up a tiny bit we've got the holes for the winches and some other deck gear bits so um, you'll remember you'll remember I had some gel coat made up for doing the locker lids so um, as well as doing some other repairs around the boat I'm just going to clean up these holes with my little Dremel which isn't a Dremel it's a it's a Bosch um, uh, and then drop some uh, color match gel coat into this so that it will be maybe not entirely invisible um, because um, the the gel, the gel coat around the area has been weathered and the gel coat that was under the cleats hasn't been weathered um, but it will be pretty close. I already dropped some thickened resin into all these holes just to make it watertight when the boat was outside but now I just need to give it a little bit of a key and just open them up very slightly with my general little, um, little grinding doodad on the end and, uh, and then I can drop some gel in. So it's kind of the same deal here on the coach roof. You can see where the old halyard winch was. That will get um, replaced, but it may not be exactly here. It may need to move up slightly to get the right lead position onto the clutches, which will be fitted just out of shot. Oh, here's my gel coat. Just basically blobbing it into these little holes, or depressions, because they're not holes, because I've already filled them. Um, if I overfill them slightly, it means I can come back when it's all hardened and just take the tops off and we will have a fairly decent repair. What you didn't see was me having a clean up with acetone around all these holes prior to putting the gel coat in them. So this is just a mixing stick that I've broken in half just to give me a, a pointed end just to pick up the gel and uh, drop it in the holes. Still got a bit of sealant to clean up from the old winches at some point I'll do that maybe when I take off the excess gel coat and then we'll have virgin decks again ready for the new deck gear drying is continuing on the hull I've got one on one side got uh, one on the other as well I'm about to put a third pad on um, in a minute because I have bought an extra vac pump so I can now run all three panels at the same time which is good. Every time I put a panel on I have to kind of draw around it just to make sure I overlap things. So you can see here I've had one panel that goes up to here and I've had another panel that goes up to that line there so I can easily see which areas have been done and which areas haven't. drying a boat I always like to use my infrared heat gun just to check the temperature of um, the pads and what have you. It's also worth thinking about the internal structure of the boat because in some areas you've got closed off compartments in other areas it will be completely open on the inside like this is so um, you do need to think about what's going on in there and the heat transfer. Certainly things like um, fridges, built-in fridges with insulation around them. Um, that's one thing that nearly caught me out uh, on the last one that I did. I just wasn't thinking and uh, I've got a very hot spot on the inside and in the laminate. Fortunately, it wasn't a major, major issue. It's caught in time, but you do need to kind of think about these things and just check that the temperature controller in the panel is um, controlling the temperature of the panel properly. It's now Monday morning and uh, drying continues. I'm afraid there isn't a lot to see really. I've been slowly working my way down the 
port side, you can see the areas here. I'm about half to two thirds of the way down. I've uh, been doing uh, the keel yesterday and overnight. And uh, there's my smaller pad that I use just to fill in the gaps because um, I can't always do the whole surface with the big panel. So that works um, quite well. There's a little um, rectangle just in there, which I've still yet to do, just above here. Uh, and you can see it's has, it hasn't changed colour like the rest of it, so um, I'm going to have to move that small panel up and do that one next, I think. But I thought this might be a good opportunity just to talk about what it is that I'm trying to resolve and what actually causes osmosis to start with. Thing about boats is that they are waterproof but they're not waterproof um, they're made out of polyester the vast majority like this one and um, polyester at a molecular level is not absolutely 100 waterproof and gel coat which is this stuff even less so so when uh, the boats were originally built back in the 60s and 70s and in the 80s as well um, they didn't have as good resins as came uh, later and uh, as boats are built now. So um, the water permeability of the um, gel coat and the resins used was less. Um, but you can still get osmosis on, on new build boats, but it's less common. And if you do get it on newer boats, it tends to be just below the surface of the gel coat and, and not really into the laminate so much. When the polyester cures there you don't always get a 100 percent cure rate on the resin so you get um chemicals that are left over um there are other parts of the the chemical composition of the polyester as well things called glycols um which are water scavenging and um they are hydroscopic so um unfortunately because they're sitting in the um laminate and in the gel coat they try and absorb water which is why you get osmosis because osmosis is in fact the um, transfer of liquids from um, one place to another for a semi-permeable membrane um, the problem is that if you get um, a very damp laminate um, you can get little pockets of moisture build up around these hydroscopic chemical elements uh, and that's what we had on this boat, which is what has caused all the blisters. And slowly those blisters grow and grow and grow and grow and go. And if they're in the laminate itself, can cause fairly significant structural damage over a long period of time. Um, so you can ignore osmosis for a period of time, um, but you can't ignore it forever. Um, and the good news is if you've got a slightly newer boat, the osmotic blisters, as I said, do tend to be much, much shallower, they tend to be just under the gel coat um, and not into the laminate. And on slightly older boats like this one, the, um, the likelihood of having blisters into the laminate is higher. Um, having said that, the last one I did of these, about 98% of the blisters were just underneath gel coat. Um, it wasn't as bad as this one, um, uh, whereas this one had a lot of blisters in the laminate as uh, as we have seen let me show you an example of that so while i remove the vast majority of the blisters during the peeling process and then the subsequent media blasting there were still a few that were very deep into the laminate and here's a couple of examples here that you can see where they've been opened up um, but um, that is probably another I'm going to say two mil into the laminate there where um, where a water pocket or an osmotic pocket has um, developed over time and that was slowly pulling the laminate apart and I will eventually once this drying period is over have to grind that out and remake that surface with some glass um, to bring it back level and what you've got to remember is I've already removed about a mil mil and a half of material so this is a further mil and a half maybe two mil into the laminate so those were pretty deep and you've got the same up here as well, just at the back there. I mean, it's all perfectly fixable, but for those people that say, oh, well, osmosis never really causes any harm to boats, it never causes any damage, well, I'm afraid it does. Um, you can get very significant structural damage from osmosis if it's left long enough and if it is bad enough. So in the vast majority of cases, yes, you can ignore it. You don't have to worry too much, but it can cause big problems 
if it's uh, unchecked and uh, allowed to uh, allowed to get bad as it was on this boat. I wonder if any of you spotted in the background of that last shot these little bumps here and wonder what they are. You maybe thought they were massive osmotic blisters. They're not. I'll show you what they are. So uh, I need to pull the panel off anyway so that I can reposition it. Um, let's switch those off. So that... oh. Oh. Well stuck on. There we go. I'll just gently release it off the vacuum tape. Because oh. mats are made out of silicon. Once you've got them going, they come off quite easily. And those little bumps were me sealing off some seacock through hole holes. So um, I needed to um, obviously create a vacuum and I couldn't do that with the old holes there. So I'll just put a bit of back tape around those and the big one here. So with the mat off, I've got my meter out, my Tramex skipper. Um, and that number there says 27. You probably can't see that. Um, you just have to take my word for it. Um, if I put that on there, it's, um, it's not reading anything. It's reading absolutely zero. Um, zero, 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 zero. Just starting to get something there, but that's because that's where the main bulkhead is, so it's reading and picking up the moisture in the wood in the main bulkhead on the other side. So ideally I would have the new version of this because it has a deep and a shallow um, uh, meter. This only has a deep meter so effectively it's recording up to I think 30 mil through the laminate um, which is way too deep and why it's picking up all the um, internal stuff. If I had the new version or the sovereign meter I think it is that has a shallow setting which is 10 mil um, which would be much better for actually doing this but this works well enough as long as you keep in mind what's on the inside of the boat here you can see why i have a smaller pad to go with my bigger pads because getting a bigger pad to stick into that funny shape there is really not going to be easy at all so these little vac pumps that i've been using for my um heating and vacuum drying rig um, on the hull work pretty well but they only have a very small amount of oil in them and um, when I'm still putting the pad on it's sucking a lot of air out and you do lose a little bit of oil out of the um, breather thing the exhaust here um, it collects most of it but some of it does kind of spit out so I do have to top it up fairly regularly the other thing which I'm about to do now is I need to change the oil every now and again um, because these are very very small pumps and I'm not convinced they're really designed for the kind of long-term use that I'm putting them to um, but I decided it was better to have multiple small pumps than one big pump. The oil does pick up contaminants from um, uh, from the um, stuff that it's drawing out of the laminate so I do have to change it because I think it damages the internals but that's a fairly easy process. There's a drain plug just there and that's the filler up there. There we go. It's actually not too bad, but it's just starting to get a little bit cloudy. This was, I shall show you in a minute. The vac pump oil is not that expensive. It's just like changing the oil on a car. There we go. So that's, that's the oil I've just removed. Stuff I'm putting back in is almost clear so you can see it's picked up some contaminants from um, use. You'll possibly remember from earlier videos this boat had two huge anodes so I've got four anode stud holes which I'm going to fill and glass up. Um, there's also going to be a change to the location of the, ah, can't see it. Um, under there is the old seacock for um, the engine inlet and we're going to be moving it down there. So it's um, 
closer to where it is on the um, on the newer boats that are built and it'll be under the step as you walk into the boat rather than under the engine because that's a silly place to have it. So at the back here I've just dished out these holes so that I can lay up some glass so there's a little bit of thickened epoxy in the hole which is trying to drip out uh, but that's going to get pushed back in with the glass on top. Here's my little circles of glass so uh, I'm just making sure they are fully wetted out before I smush them in against the hole and I shall do something similar on the inside. These holes were quite small so it wasn't worth doing a big repair on them so just a bit of thickened epoxy in the holes. Glass on either side, job's a good one. There we go, with the glass now in, we've got four neat little repair patches like this, which are almost flush with the surface. You might remember from an earlier video that I had to remove the stern tube out of Lottie because water was getting into the boat around the outside of the stern tube. Now that's not uncommon on Contessas, unfortunately. They had originally fitted some bronze uh, stern tubes on these boats and uh, unfortunately bonding metal to GLP or glass fibre is not always the easiest task or not the most successful long term. Uh, this one had already been replaced and it had a stainless steel um, stern tube but that had the same problem, water was getting past it and into the void which is in the skeg and potentially into the boat as well. So out that one came as well and what I'm going to replace it with is a glass fibre stern tube I've done a number of these uh, with the help of my friend Robin who has the equipment that you can see just behind me there to bore out the stern tube very accurately so that we can retain exactly the position of the new stern tube in the old hole. So we make the cut in stages. The, um, the cutting head gets moved up the bar by um, kind of probably three inches at a time so we do a cut and then we pull the bar out and then uh, reset the cutter slightly further up the bar and then uh, push it back in and then carry on cutting and we do that all the way through until it pops out the other side. It's all run by that big motor there's a couple of universal joints on the um, on the sort of drive bar that gets attached to the back of the boring bar. All clever stuff, but it ensures we do a nice, accurate hole for the new stern tube to get bonded into. It also gives a really nice clean surface that needs virtually no prep, just a kind of a hoover and a wipe with acetone, um, because you've got nice clean glass fibre to bond to. Well, that's Robin just setting the depth of cut. So we can adjust where the cutter sits on the boring bar. And by carefully measuring, we cut away just the material we need. There you can see the boring bar. Robin's just stopped it because of course I just started filming. So um, there it is turning. It's running on that bearing and the bearing is just temporarily bonded into the hull so that everything stays in the right place. Uh, Robin has finished doing his stern tube bore. If I angle the camera correctly, you can see all the way up there into the boat, which is quite pleasing. So um, quite a bit of moisture is coming out of that foam, having run his cutter up there. I don't know whether it's exposed wet foam or what, but um, that is going to have to continue drying out, or I'm going to have to get in there and dig out the old foam. But whilst he's been doing that, and because the hull is very largely fully dried. I've been looking at these repairs. Uh, you can see I highlighted them previously in green and I've been going through them all, numbering them, working out how much glass I need to put into each one. And I've gone round and I've kind of sanded all these and prepped all these for putting some glass in. So um, what I've done is I've labeled them A, B, C, D, all the rest of it um, going down the hull. Uh, and I've put a number next to it based on how much glass I think each one needs. So um, that one needs two layers just to bring the surface back up to um, flush with the surrounding area. So I've done that all over the boat, or well, at least down the port side, because I'm going to do one side at a time. 
and I've just cut up a load of glass and I'll bring you around here to match equally labelled up so that I know where they go. So I'm going to cut all that glass up with my shears and then do a bit of lamina laminating pre-lunch uh, to get that side done whilst my friendly assistant has the tiresome job of removing vac tape. We really are at the final stages of drying out this hull now which is good. Um, I'm kind of doing what I'd call the fiddly bits so uh, I've just wrapped the uh, smaller vac pad around the front of the keel there so that's been uh, doing its job there for the last um, 12 hours or so. Um, it's actually been on overnight, um, not heating the whole time but I just left the vacuum running. While that vac pad is warming up I've just been going around and pulling off the peel ply on all the little repairs that I did yesterday. Oh I missed one. And uh, seeing how they look. Uh, all seem pretty good. What's nice is they're all ever so slightly over filled if you like so um, I dished out all of these and then laid up glass based on uh, how deep that dish was so this one needed three layers and that is perfect it's almost completely flush it's just very slightly high on that side so I can come back in and just buzz over that with my sander just to make it all flattened at the same height as the rest of the uh, hull and uh, they're all looking pretty good, actually. Oh, and this one there as well. And, uh, yeah, it's fairly flush. It's just ever so slightly proud at the edges, which is perfect. Just sand those back. There's the ones at the stern. So I've just got all those little repairs done. I can't remember if there's any under this heat mat here. I'm gonna have a look in a minute. It's now seven o'clock Monday morning. It's raining outside, so I'm quite pleased to be inside the tent. I've just removed the heat pad that was on the bottom of the keel. You can see that is gone from down there. I've got two last little areas to do my heat and vacuum on, and then she's all done. So they are just kind of behind me. So you can see a bit of the hull. I'm just gonna move you up. Uh, so I've got a bit up there and it's got all the lower part of the skeg as well. So the plan is to put the heat pads on the upper parts because I've got a few small little repairs to do on the lower part of the skeg as I've done on other parts of the boat like that. Um, and then uh, while that is doing its job, I am going to make a start on the repair to the bottom of the keel. The vac tape's slightly in the way, but you can see what's going on down there. It's had a big bump in the front of the keel there. So um, there's damage to the front and there is damage underneath, if I can get the camera to show you that. So I covered that in an earlier video, if you're interested. I've got a similar, but not quite as bad, piece of damage at the back there. You can see it's a bit of a funny shape. I'll see if I can draw this out for you. So if you can imagine the keel should kind of look like this. So that's the outer glass fibre skin. In the middle of here is a big chunk of lead and that lead is sitting in kind of resin there. I probably ought to do that in a different colour as I have two colours so um, when they build the boats they build the two halves of the hull put them together glass them together and then they drop a load of kind of resin with chop strands in it in here and then they drop the lead down into it uh, and that all goes off and um, that's all good the problem we have is on Lottie at the moment that GRP skin at the front is kind of bit like that and a bit like that and it has large chunks kind of missing from there and you can see certainly at the back and a little bit at the front the lead so my plan is to mix up 
initially some uh, resin with some chop strands and then to thicken it up with some silica and I'm going to chuck that in kind of here both at the front and underneath um, and I'll probably have to hold that in place. I mean, I can thicken it up and it will kind of stick and roughly stay where I want it to go, but I'm either going to put some kind of masking tape or possibly just use some peel ply and use the peel ply to help hold it kind of in shape. Let that go off and then once that's all done, I will lay up some glass over the top to bring it back to how it should be with a new skin on the keel both forward and aft so in terms of cutting the glass i'm probably gonna because i want to build up thickness i'm gonna have to grind these sides back so i've got a nice taper and then um that's not a very good picture but i'm going to end up something with a taper like that That's going to be my new material that I've kind of put in there. And then I'm going to lay up a new glass layer like this. So it's going to be tapered, tapered, uh, and hopefully get a nice new um, bond. And we'll end up with a nice new front bit of keel there. So in terms of the glass I'm going to have to cut up, I'm probably going to, to make this taper kind of make up some glass areas like this to kind of make that shape up under the front of the keel. So this will be the aft of the keel, this will be the forward of the keel. So I'm going to make kind of a bandage that's going to stick itself back up onto the bottom of the keel at the back, uh, sorry, at the front here. So this doesn't look terribly exciting, but it's as far as I've got for now. So I got in there with my little belt sander and my Dremel and cleaned out as much of the loose stuff as possible and gave it all a good key for the repair. I then mixed up some epoxy uh, with some long strands of chopped glass in it and then some um, low density and high density filler just to kind of bulk it out. Um, I didn't want to use all low density filler because I want it to be as strong as possible, but I also need to sand it a bit. So I've done kind of a first fill and then I've covered it in um, peel ply because I want the peel ply to help hold the, um, the filler in because there's so much weight in the material that I've put in there. I was worried about it starting to sag out because um, there's quite a lot there. I'm expecting it to exotherm a little bit, so it's going to warm up as part of its cure. Um, but then that potentially makes it a little bit more runny. So there's always the risk that it's going to start dropping out the bottom of the repair. So a um, little bit of peel ply on there was easy enough to kind of wrap around the bottom of the keel and uh, that should hold it there whilst it cures. I'll then almost certainly have to do a second fill on that just to get the levels looking half decent. So whilst I'm waiting for that to cure, I've got some more repairs to do on the hull. One of the things I need to do is um, we're moving the uh, seacock for the engine. I've mentioned that before, so what I'm going to do, because I can't get to the inside of the um, engine compartment very easily to do all the kind of grinding I need to, to dish out the, um, the, the, the laminate to make a really good repair on the inside, I'm just going to chuck some polyester filler on the inside just temporarily, and that will give me something I can lay up glass to on the outside, because the key thing at the moment is I want the outside skin to be finished. And I'm going to do exactly the same thing with these heads, um, seacocks here, because um, we're not sure yet exactly what the layout of the heads is going to be once it's been rebuilt. But there's a high probability that the seacocks are going to move from where they are now. So I'm going to mix up some polyester filler, chuck that in the holes with some tape on the outside. That will cure quite quickly. And then I can come back in with my little grinder and uh, prepare the outside for some glass to be laid up in those holes. Um, and then when it comes to doing the inside, all I need to do is grind through my polyester filler until I get to the glass which I've laid up on the outside and I can finish the repair properly at a later date. So here's one I repaired earlier in true Blue Peter style. Um, that one has been done properly. That was the old log fitting. And I think I cover that repair on the video to do with what's going on inside the boat. Um, but uh, that's kind of what sort of finish I'm going for. It needs a little bit of a sand there, actually. I can feel it's ever so slightly high still. Um, but uh, 
I'm going to do exactly the same with those. So there's the head seacock outlet. So I uh, put some polyester filler on the inside, then that's set. I've then dished these out. So I'm going to lay up three layers of glass, small, medium, and large circles in the uh, in the little holes there that I've made. And uh, I've got a few other little repairs to do as well. Uh, some near the stern and the engine seacock. So once they are all done. I uh, need to start thinking what I'm going to do with the old depth transducer because I do have a new fitting to go in there but I'm not sure that if it's the same size so I'm going to have to have a little look to see what's going to fit or whether I'm going to end up needing to repair that as well. It's now the next day and all these little repairs have cured over the last um, 12 hours or so so they are now all ready to be pulled off and um whoop, and um feels pretty flat so that just needs a little buzz over with the sander and then uh they are all ready for the next stage so i've had a quick look at the keel as well that's going to need another fill which i thought it would but it's getting there so here's the keel having had its first fill and it's not too bad actually um i was expecting it to need more filling than it does. I mean, it doesn't need another fill because there's the odd gap here, um, just where I chuck that in. So, um, but that's a really good, really good solid base to start from. So I think a second fill today, and then I'm going to let that completely cure. Uh, and then uh, tomorrow I'll be in a position where I can put glass on that uh, and finish up the repair. So I've just applied more filler and then peel ply over the top and you wouldn't normally use peel ply over the top of filler necessarily um, but there is two good reasons for doing it in this situation one is it's holding the filler up into the um, repair and because i've got a heater just here warming up everything there's a chance that the resin might become more liquid and try and kind of sag and and, and drip off so it's holding it up um, but secondly even with my bare hand, without a gloved hand, I can actually kind of smush this around a little bit inside the um, inside the peel ply, and it's suitably thickened, but it's not soaking through the peel ply. So any little lumps and bumps from when I was doing it with a spreader earlier, um, I can kind of smooth out with my hand and just make it all nice and smooth, which reduces the amount of sanding I have to do a little bit later. So that's all good. I think I need a bit more tape just on there though. Because it's been a slightly cold day, I have had the heaters out and this fill here has dried sufficiently that I've been able to take the peel ply off it. And it's actually a really nice shape. Using that peel ply makes such a nice job of it because uh, as you saw, I could kind of smooth it out with my hands and that is very nearly the shape that we want so I'm at a position now where I can kind of flat that all back again with the sander and then prepare it for laying up some glass but I won't be able to do that immediately because tomorrow morning the boat is hopefully going to be coming out of the shed so that I can give it a pressure wash all over just to get rid of any contaminants that are on the surface from the drying process the other thing that I have done today and I had to give it a really good clean because it hadn't been pressure washed, was repair the area round the back at the top of the keel here. You may remember there was a load of dry laminate in there from the original build of the boat and a very slight crack. Um, I'm not entirely sure if that crack was from the boat flexing or I think it's possibly just, you know, the boat's made in two halves and it was just the join between the two halves. But either way, I have filled all the... Um, laminate or the, the the dry laminate that I kind of removed with the Dremel and then um, have laid up some glass over the top of it so it's now going to be perfect. The other thing I've done today is to remove the old depth transducer that is up here. Um, the old transducer had a flange around it although there's not very much left of the flange as you can see. I kind of took some of that flange off when I was peeling the boat and the rest of it came off as part of my removal. It was well stuck in there with an adhesive sealant so um, so it was a somewhat destructive process getting this thing out. The new one 
is a bronze one. You can see this thing here. It's a knurled bronze um, fitting brought from Jeremy Rogers Limited. Uh, and because it's knurled, it's designed to be bonded in without the need for a flange or a nut on the inside to hold it in place. However, this thing here is a little bit ugly. There's a massive gap there. So I'm gonna do a little repair there um, now, and then I'll lay some glass up on it probably tomorrow, and then I can re-drill the hole so it will fit the new transducer nicely. She is all jet washed, so I've been over the hull twice with the pressure washer and it can sit now for a little while, just kind of drying in the sunshine. It's quite a nice day out here actually. And then uh, we'll shove her back in the tent and work can continue. Early morning back in the shed and I didn't show it on video yesterday but I uh, laid up the glass over the repair here at the front of the keel so that's had oh, I think it was five or six layers of the combi mat that I use um, over this so there's tons of strength back in there so um, just to recap obviously I filled the area where all the resin had been kind of shattered and knocked out and then I've rebuilt the skin with glass so it's kind of back to how it should be um, originally. I've done the same at the back and I've also done the small repair above the camera there in the um, hole which was um, for the old um, depth transducer so I'll flip the camera around and I'll show you what it looks like. There's more of a close-up of the repair at the front of the keel so the shape is pretty close to what it needs to be. It may be a small amount of fairing needed once it's all done. There's the back end of the keel. It's got a little bit of a tag there, which um, is from the peel ply where the resins run out very slightly. So again, I need to do a bit of sanding there and at the front. And uh, then that is all the repairs done. There's a little repair I did on the old depth transducer fitting so again it needs sanding and then a new hole will get cut through the repair that i've done there so very little of my repair will actually remain on the boat but i wanted to do something um, a bit better than just filling it full of filler so um, the glass over the top of the filling material that i used kind of just stabilizes it and makes a better job of the repair so that's all the drying work complete. This video has largely been about drying out the hull laminate. So just to recap, after she was peeled, I had her media blasted. I uh, then um, washed the hull down with a pressure washer many, many, many times. And that actually helped with the weather that I had at the time, which was kind of dry and warm to remove some of the moisture and some of the soil content out of the laminate, which was really good. Um, but there's only so far you can go with that in a short period of time, unless you want to leave your boat outside for months and months and months in some warm weather. So I then use my heat and vacuum system to remove the moisture content and um, the other chemicals that are in the laminate to get it fully dry. The moisture meter has been all over the boat now and um, it's, it's as dry as it's going to get, I think. Um, the only slightly damp places that I can find are where I'm picking up the internal structure of the boat, whether it's bulkheads or floors or, or other things. Um, in the skeg, I'm still getting some high moisture meter meat readings, but that's because I'm picking up the foam which is inside the skeg which is waterlogged. So that's gonna to have to get dealt with in a later video. So I've got a little bit of sanding left to do on the uh, repairs that I've done on the bottom of the keel and on the hull, but she's basically now ready to have that new layer of glass put all over the hull and to finish off the osmosis treatment. That brings us to the end of this video. Thank you very, very much for watching. I really appreciate it. Um, in the next episode, you will see either some works going on inside or um, the continuation of the work on the bottom. So. Um, I'm going to be covering her with glass and then lots of filling and fairing and then she'll get a barrier coat on top of that and then finally some anti-fouling. Unfortunately I've got to end this video with some slightly sad news. I found out last night that Jeremy Rogers has died. Uh, Jeremy was the, um, well, the father of the Contessa 32 really and um, he and David Sadler designed 
the 32, um, he also built many other Contessas um, and is a very well-known um, guy in the Contessa world and in the sailing world generally. He was a fantastic boat builder. Uh, he was a thoroughly nice bloke. Um, he was a very, very accomplished sailor as well. So uh, my thoughts go out to his family and his friends. Um, very sad news indeed. I'm sure he will uh, be remembered very fondly by all those who met him, including myself. Thanks again for watching, really appreciate it, and uh, I'll see you on the next one.